Our next speaker has a similarly interdisciplinary background. She holds a PhD in vision science from the University of Cambridge, but has worked uh, more recently at the University of Pittsburgh in the history and philosophy of science. And she's going to talk to us about color. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, and thank you for the Einstein Forum um, for inviting me here to speak about the uh, history and philosophy of color. So um, I, I wrote a book on the, the topic which came out last year. And since then, I've, um, I've changed my mind about some of the things I wrote in the book. So here I'm going to be discussing some new work um, about the, um, his, the historical background to the philosophical problem of color. Um, so. So in this lecture, I'll be saying a bit about how philosophers have traditionally um, understood the metaphysics of color. Um, and um, in particular, this idea of the scientific image, which is contrasted with the manifest image. And then in the third part of the talk, which is most of the talk, I'll speak a bit about um, the uh, history of the mind sciences in the 19th century and how I think this really has shaped the um, philosophical problem of color. So let me begin. Do colors exist or are they merely an illusion? This is the typical useless philosophical question. Just like the questions, is there an external world? Does anything exist? Science, unlike philosophy, deals with tractable questions which have factual answers. Abstract philosophical speculation about what does and doesn't exist has been made redundant by the natural sciences. The physical sciences can tell us what is there in the world around us, whether properties like color exist. And the sciences of the mind, psychology and neuroscience, can inform us about when and under what conditions our senses lead us into the traps of illusion. End of story. <laughs> if this really were the end of the story, we would have a very short lecture. As you must already be guessing, I don't believe what I just said, and I don't think you should either. There's a line of thought which says we should take the philosophical problem of color seriously because it gets to the heart of the metaphysical commitments of modern science as it emerged in the 17th century. The mathematical and mechanical worldview of modern physical sciences pushed color out of reality. <coughs> Great physicists like Galileo and Newton created the problem of color. Therefore, science itself can't answer the questions about the reality of color. Okay. So Alfred North Whitehead was one early 20th century thinker who framed the problem in this way. Following his seminal work on analytical philosophy with Bertrand Russell, the Principia Mathematica, he turned his attention to the metaphysics and the history of ideas. This is how he frames the issue in his book, Science in the Modern World, originally a series of lectures given in 1925. So he writes, but whatever theory of light you choose, there is no light or color as a fact in external nature. There is merely motion of material. Again, when the light enters your eyes and falls on the retina, there is merely motion of material. Then your nerves are affected and your brain is affected. And again, this is merely motion of material. But the mind, in apprehending, also experiences sens sensations which, properly speaking, are qualities of the mind alone. These sensations are projected by the mind so as to clothe appropriate bodies in external qualities which in reality do not belong to them, qualities which, in fact, are purely the offspring of the mind. Nature is a dull affair, soundless, scentless, colorless, merely the hurrying of material, endlessly, meaninglessly. However you disguise it, this is the practical outcome of the characteristic scientific philosophy which closed the 17th century. So I endorsed that kind of account in my book on the philosophy of color, which is called Outside Color. Nowadays, I don't believe what I wrote there. So this is like the received view, and you see it all over the place um, in philosophy articles about color. Um, so the point of this lecture is to present a new historical narrative about the emergence of philosophical concerns about the existence of color. 
So I will place the blame not with physics, but with physiology of, of the brain and nervous system. Our historical focus will not be on the 17th century, but instead we'll examine the mind-brain sciences of the 19th century. Before that, I'll first say more about the philosophical problems of colour and how they seem to take a grip on the intellectual imagination with the so-called scientific revolution of the 17th century. Um, so look around you and open your eyes. Open your ears. Attend to any smells and whatever tactile experiences you have. Physical reality appears to us full of things with sensory qualities. <coughs> the red and black in my dress, the faint odor of the air you inhale, the peculiar accent in my voice. This is the manifest image. Here's a picture of the manifest image. In everyday life, your actions reveal your complete faith in the, in the reality of the manifest world. Your life literally depends on the evidence of colors, smells, and tastes that the chemicals in your food and drink are nutrients and not poisons. However, if we ask a chemist to an analyze the constituents of what's on your plate, no report will be given of any of those qualities. Your food consists only of long chains of complex organic molecules sprinkled with inorganic minerals and additives. Chemical analysis might be a more reliable way of detecting poisons in your food than the results of our senses, but it does take the pleasure out of eating. There's no inviting colors, no enticing scents, no delicious tastes. The scientific image of your meal is absolutely unlike the manifest one. So the mid 20th century American philosopher, Wilfred Sellers, who was at the University of Pittsburgh, which is where I now work, he introduced this terminology of the clash of the manifest and scientific images. And he encouraged us to trace this back to the 17th century. So this is Wilfred Sellers, and this is a picture of a pink ice cube, because this was his favorite example of an object which appears in the manifest image, but not in the scientific image. So he wrote that it's a familiar fact that those features of the manifest world which play no role in mechanical explanation were relegated by Descartes and others, interpreters of the new physics, to the minds of the perceiver. Color, for example, was said to exist only in sensation. It was argued, in effect, that these supposed independent colored things are actually conceptual constructions which ape the mechanical systems of the real world. So this is the familiar narrative. The rise of the mechanical view of nature, um, of which Descartes' natural philosophy is exemplary, rested on the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. The primary qualities are properties of bodies which can be measured and quantified, and which feature in mechanical explanations of things such as chemical reactions, collisions, and the propagation of light. Uh, these primary qualities are shape, motions, mass, texture, and they contrast with the secondary qualities, which are tactile sensations like heat, coolness, um, roughness, tastes, sounds, smells, colors. And all these secondary qualities are useless in mechanical explanation, and we can't um, have mathematical formulas which like describe how... Um, Hold something is, not in a literal way, in the way that the world appears to us. So the idea is that these secondary qualities are stripped from the external world of physics and given a new location in the subjective space of the mind. So it's interesting that Sellers introduces these views as a, in quotes, familiar fact, because this is not the account which we find in the 17th century authors themselves and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, yet it was the standard reconstruction of their views. So along with Whitehead's Science in the Modern World, um, other key texts here are Edwin Burt's um, The Metaphysics of Modern Science, which first came out in 1924, and um, Husserl's Crisis of European Sciences, which was written in the 30s but published later, also has a familiar also uses this kind of um, idea. 
Um, so Lorraine Daston, um, in a paper from 1991, writing on Burke's um, history of science, notes, notices this elegiac theme, she calls it, this sadness about these works. It's a sense of loss for the innocence of this pre-modern, pre-scientific worldview. So people like Burke write um, that back in the Middle Ages, there was no reason to disown any naive belief in the, rea in the reality of appearances of the senses. So for Burt, there's this alignment between sensory experience and beliefs about reality. And the pre-modern world was hospitable, just as the modern scientific world is cold, colorless, and alienating. The primary and secondary quality distinction is not like any usual philosophical refinement. For people like Bert, it was a tearing in the very fabric of reality. Um, so here's an example. Bert wrote that in the Middle Ages, the entire world of nature was held not only to exist for man's sake, but to be likewise immediately present and fully intelligible to his mind. So when you have this complete a match between appearance and reality, it also makes the world much more comprehensible. This is the idea that Burt has. So compelling as this narrative has been to many 20th and 21st century historians and philosophers, myself including when I wrote the book, it must now be scrutinized. And Dastan argues quite convincingly that the epistemological anxieties which we associate with the primary secondary quality distinction were simply not there in the early modern texts. Um, so a popular misreading of the notion of secondary qualities is that they are purely mental. Um, the English 17th century writers who popularized the primary secondary distinction, John Locke and Robert Boyle, present it in the context of matter theory not theory of mind. The idea is that the corpuscles or atoms, which they believe make up all matter, have primary qualities, which again are motion, rest, size, shape, and they come in special arrangements or textures. These primary qualities give matter the power or disposition to affect our sensory organs, our eyes, our nose, our ears, in special ways. At that time, but not now, it remained an open scientific possibility that there would be just one particular arrangement of primary physical qualities that could be associated with each specific shade of color, such that the experience of green, for example, just presents a corresponding objective property to us. So imagine if there was a particular atom or texture of atoms which was green. So an interesting example comes in Robert Boyle's Experiments and Considerations Touching Colours, published in 1664, which reports an anecdote about a blind man from the Low Countries who is able to distinguish the colour of ribbons by using his sense of touch. Boyle entertains it as a possibility that the particular texture of corpuscles or atoms associated with black, white, yellow, etc., might be perceptible to this individual because his tactile sensitivity is more acute than sighted pupils. So he thought there could just be a texture in all kinds of fabrics, which is just the texture of black. So even Descartes, who in his meditation speaks negatively about the senses as confused and potentially deceptive, does tell us that there is a firm physical basis for color experience Color sensations are caused by particular motions of the particles which make up light beams, which have a predictable effect on the motion of optic nerve fibers. Now Locke does point out that it is inconceivable how particular kinds of primary qualities bear any relation to the sensory ideas that they cause in us. So he writes in the essay concerning human understanding that we are so far from knowing what figure, size, or motion of parts produce a yellow color, a sweet taste, or a sharp sound, that we can by no means conceive how any size, figure, or motion of any particles can possibly produce in us the idea of any color, taste, or sound whatsoever. There is no conceivable connection between one or the other. 
So the idea is that even if there is a particular texture of matter which is green, that doesn't explain why we perceive it as having this particular green quality. But Locke goes on to say that this is down to the arbitrary will and good pleasure of the wise architect. In other words, God has arranged the world such that we experience these uh, primary qualities in these characteristic ways. And that's just part of his worldview that God has made it that way. So this passage is quoted by a contemporary philosopher, Barry Stroud, in order to highlight the lack of what he calls, in quotes, a satisfying natural explanation of sensory experience. However, this opposition of naturalistic and theistic science, a science which brings God into the picture like this, itself only comes in with the 19th century. So we can't interpret Locke as pointing to what we would call an explanatory gap. The shift from mechanical to theistic explanation just wouldn't have stuck out for Locke in the same way that it does for us now. <clears throat> what we can say is that the innovators of mechanics and optics of the 17th century did sometimes make declarations which pose questions about the reality of color. Um, Descartes was one such thinker, Galileo and Newton were others. So here's a quotation from Newton, which you often see in uh, pieces on the philosophy of color. And he's discussing his famous prism experiments. He writes, and if at any time I speak of light and rays as colored or endued with colors, I would be understood to speak not philosophically and properly, but grossly and according to such conceptions as vulgar people in seeing all these experiments would be apt to frame. For the rays to speak properly are not colored. But just as we read these passages as reflecting our own anxiety about the reality of color, it doesn't mean that these anxieties were felt centuries ago in the same way. It's easy to see in the past a, mi a mirror of the present. It is in more, rec re more recent, but actually less well-known history that we find a better likeness to ourselves. Um, to put my new account in a nutshell, the problem of color arises precisely when research is being directed at creating naturalistic explanations for mental phenomena, not only perceiving and sensing, but also thinking and willing. So we'll go on to talk about the 19th century thing. So in my alternative to the dominant narrative, I agree with Bert Whitehead and Husserl that the problem of color comes to philosophical prominence with the birth of modern sciences the difference is that I date the relevant birth two centuries after they do. The scientific developments crucial to the problem were ones happening in the life and mind sciences, physiology, biology, and psychology. And where physics has a role in the story, it's not with um, mathematical methods in general, but the discovery of the law of conservation of energy. Um, I'll focus on three men whose thoughts are not forgotten, so every, people have mostly heard about these people, these um, individuals, but their writings aren't much read in philosophy. I'm speaking in Anglophone philosophy um, these days. So these are the synthetic philosopher and evolutionary theorist, Herbert Spencer, Thomas Henry Huxley, the comparative biologist and popularizer of evolutionary theory, um, often called Darwin's bulldog. Um, Herbert Spencer, incidentally, um, invented the phrase survival of the fittest. So Darwin never taught the survival of the fittest, that was Herbert Spencer. So evolutionary theory was very important to how um, they saw the world. And also uh, we have the Berlin-based neurophysiologist Emile dubois Cremond. Um, so he was um, well known, he's credited with, invent, uh, with discovering the action potential and showing that um, the electricity which operates in animals' nervous system is the same kind of electricity as you find in non-living systems. So he um, basically 
um, refuted vitalistic theories of how the brain and nervous system worked. So needless to say, my selection is somewhat arbitrary. Um, perhaps I could just as well have chosen Hermann von Helmholtz, um, also the psychophysicist and philosopher Gustav Fechner, and the neurologist John Hewlings Jackson. So Hewlings Jackson is someone that I've been um, looking at recently. He has very interesting stuff about the problem of mental causation. Again, he's not someone that philosophers ever talk about, but I think it's really relevant to how we see these issues in philosophy of mind today. So the purpose of this is not to give you a definitive chronicle of all of this talk about mind and color um, in this era, but just to convince you that this is a period worth looking into. So, Herbert Spencer. Now, you might have also heard of him for his social Darwinist defense of free market capitalism. Um, but before that, um, back in 1855, and this was four years before The Origin of, the S Origin of Species was published, um, he wrote his first major work, which was The Principles of Psychology. So this text is quite boring and long-winded to read now. It's more like um, metaphysics than anything that you'd see just a couple of decades later in um, experimental psychology and physiology. So there's no experiments in there. He's just um, coming up with all these ideas about the mind, which he connects to um, metaphysics, um, Kantian metaphysics, and also people, obscure people like Hamilton. Um, but it's interesting that he brings up the primary and secondary quality distinction as part of the study of the mind. <coughs> So in Spencer, the secondary qualities are rebranded as dynamical attributes. The important point is that these are in no way mental properties. They're entirely physical, but they have their origins and forces rather than the objects around us. So he writes, um, those properties of things which we know as tastes, scents, colors, temperatures, sounds, are effects produced in us by forces in the environment. The subject undergoes a change of state determined in him by some external agency directly or indirectly proceeding from the object. In respect of all these so-called secondary attributes, the object is active and the subject is passive. Or in other words, they are dynamical attributes. Um, so you see what I mean about his long-winded writing. <laughs> so I don't recommend that you read the whole book. It's quite boring. Um, but these dynamical attributes do not present any distinct philosophical challenges. They are as easily known as any other physical attributes and can be fitted without trouble into a world picture which consists of matter and forces. So this is the key thing. He's not just thinking that there are atoms and corpuscles out there, but that the forces um, he describes make up a fundamental part of reality. Um, so Spencer does not think of the primary properties, which he calls statical attributes, as in any way more objective than his secondary dynamical ones. In fact, the opposite. He argues that activity on the part of the perceiver is required for the perception of primary statical attributes, um, which are size, shape, and position in space for him. And this is because he says that we perceive those properties by the modality of touch, this is interesting. And this sense requires that we move our body. Like if I run my hand along the edges of this table, then I perceive the um, shape and the length of it, but I have to move in order to do that. So because I'm active in this process, um, my perception of the um, size and shape and length of the table is less um, objective for Spencer. So we see, even as late as the middle of the 19th century, colors were not taken to be unreal, and certainly not more subjective or mysterious than the primary properties. So according to um, Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison, and this is from their 2007 book, Objectivity, um, they say a change occurs so that, and to quote, by the late 19th century, color had become a paradigm paradigmatic example of private 
<clears throat> incommunicable subjectivity. Their explanation for this shift is that it comes about with the experimental psychology and physiology of color experience. So they talk a lot about Goethe's um, Zur Farbenlehre, which was published in 1810, and his um, distinction between subjective color effects and objective ones. So subjective effects originate in the eye, and objective ones are due to external light sources. Um, the subjective effects come under increasing <coughs> scrutiny of scientists, so people like Helmholtz, Purkinje, and Herring. And also color blindness and other kinds of variation in color perception are increasingly recognized and studied. So um, one thing they talk about is that before this era, people didn't really pay attention to color blindness. I mean, color blindness people must have been around because it's quite a common thing, but it wasn't really discussed um, by scientists. So there's the sudden realization that there's a lot of variability in how people perceive the colors in the world, and this becomes a topic for um, research. So the idea is that colors pass from being anchored in objective physical stimuli to being thought of as subjective effects of nervous stimulation, literally there in the eye of the beholder. Thus the location of color in the scientific image has been moved from the objective domain of physics to the subjective one of psychophysiology. That is not to say that this placed color in the scientific backwater. On the contrary, phys physiology was a high profile high technology discipline at the time, and discussion of it attracted lots of popular attention. So um, T.H. Huxley was one of the most influential popularizers of the new biological sciences. He himself was a comparative zoologist, geologist, essayist, and polemicist. His delineation of naturalistic as opposed to theistic science shaped the conception of science still employed in the English-speaking world. While Huxley did not perform neurophysiological experiments himself, the findings of others influenced him deeply in his writings on explanations of the mind. And these, in turn, had a lasting impact on the philosophy of mind via the discussion of William James and others. In the last three decades of the 19th century, the paradigm for research in neurophysiology was reductionist and mechanist. These two aspects um, are given full voice in Huxley's writing on the topic. Firstly, like Dubois Raymond, who we'll be, be talking about in a moment, Huxley is convinced of the unique power of reductive explanation. By this, I mean the reliance of decomposition of a chemical compound or a biological system into its simpler constituents and accounting for the properties and behavior of the whole in terms of the powers and actions of the parts. So, now this is a quotation. Huxley writes, we live in the hope and in the faith that by the advance of molecular physics, we shall by and by be able to see our way as clearly from the constituents of water to the properties of water as we are now able to deduce the operations of a watch from the form of its parts and the manner in which they are put together. So observe here the connection between reductive and mechanistic explanation. The prime example of a clear reductive understanding is the knowledge we can have of a man-made mechanism, a watch, by seeing how its parts work together. So Huxley called uh, physiology the mechanical engineering of living machines. Writing at a time in which steam power had been the engine of unprecedented material changes, it shouldn't surprise us that steam engines, alongside the clockwork marvels of the Enlightenment, are the go-to technologies to which he compares the biological machines studied by physiologists. Um, so he often compares a horse to a steam engine, and as he writes, a living body is a machine by which energy is transformed in the same sense as a steam machine is so. And all its movements, um, molar and molecular, are to be accounted for by the energy which is supplied to it. 
So here's, he's referring to the law of conservation of energy, so understanding all physical systems in terms of the transfer of different kinds of energies. Um, and this is really important in how Huxley thinks of um, issues of about free will, and this was a big deal at the same time, the problem of whether there's free will and whether the conservation of energy rules out um, free will. Um, but we'll just put that aside for now. Um, so there's this well-known piece of Huxley, which is called On the Hypothesis That Animals Are Automata and Its History. And the point of this piece is to convince us that the neurophysiology of his day is, if you like, the offspring of the idea of Descartes and others um, two centuries before. And this idea was that the seemingly purposive, so seemingly thoughtful behavior of animals could be entirely accounted for as just being the um, operation of a complex deterministic reflex system. So if you like a cause and effect machine, just like clockwork, um, an automaton, which is a self-winding machine, a machine which doesn't need someone else to come and set it going, but is working entirely predictably, just according to the laws of mechanics. So um, while Descartes notoriously asserted that animals were unconscious automata, so he said that animals didn't feel pain, didn't have any subjective experiences, um, Huxley tells us that the, the doctrine of continuity, by which he means the theory of evolution, um, tells us that animals have some degree of awareness. So because humans evolved from other animals, we have consciousness it would be completely strange from the biological perspective if consciousness appeared all of a sudden in humans um, and not with any lower forms of life. Um, so he thinks that animals must have some kind of consciousness. Um, but what do we say about this consciousness? Um, so the reductive and mechanistic explanations of um, functions like jumping, seeing, and writing a letter um, for Huxley, there's no use for the uh, concept of consciousness here. He thinks we can explain all these functions as entirely um, due to mechanisms. Um, so the workings of the, nerve, the, the nerves, brain, and muscle machine go happily along in a closed causal loop without the intervention of a sentient, willing mind. Thus, the sensations which we know from experience to accompany each of these activities the blueness we see when we look in a swimming pool, the act of will that prompts a jump, the feeling of muscular effort, the rush of coldness of the skin, are, Huxley tells us, mere byproducts of the brain engine. Now, this is a very famous quotation from Huxley. He writes, the consciousness of brutes, and also not just animals, but human beings, would appear to be related to the mechanism of their body simply as a collateral product of its working and to be as completely without any power of modifying that working as the steam whistle which accompanies the work of a locomotive engine is without influence upon its machinery. So you can imagine the sound generated by a steam train. Yeah, this, it's irrelevant to the workings of it. So just like that's irrelevant every time you hear a noise, say there's a loud explosion and you hear a noise, that's completely irrelevant, that sensation of the noise is completely irrelevant to whatever actions you would take. It's just every, and so the colors that we see, they're completely irrelevant to explaining um, the perceptual decisions that we make. So it's quite a radical idea. Um, it's known now in philosophy of mind as epiphenomenalism, just the idea that consciousness is completely irrelevant. <coughs> so we should think of conscious sensations then as the byproduct of our perceptual mechanisms and the irrelevance of consciousness to science is a parallel to its negligible status in our mental life. Consciousness is the residual of mechanistic and reductive explanation, that which is left over from a complete causal account of all the capacities of the brain and nervous system. So this is the narrow meaning of consciousness as qualia 
which is how um, Anglophone philosophers of mind talk about the problem of consciousness. So they think of all the different colours you experience, the sounds of things, their qualia. Um, if you know uh, Thomas Nagel's famous paper, What It's Like to Be a Bat, he says that um, animals with echolocation, so that navigate by um, using echolocation like bats do, they must have a whole range of sensations, qualia, which are completely alien to humans because we don't have that sensory modality. And he says there's this problem which science can't um, understand because we just can't imagine what it's like to be a bat. Um, so this narrow meaning of consciousness is different um, from the earlier one, which ha was a more expansive notion. So in earlier times, people wrote about consciousness as an individual mind or a self. So not just the um, sensations, but also the thoughts and experience contained with it. So there wasn't the separation between thought um, and cognition and just specific sensations. <coughs> but once we've defined conscious sensations as epiphenomenal, like the steam whistle of Huxley, um, the byproduct of, and it becomes this byproduct of scientific explanation, it would seem to follow logically that any accounting for that weird mental stuff is just beyond science. And that's exactly the, posi the position that um, our next figure, Emile dubois Raymond, will take. Um, but strangely enough, his account invited hostility and controversy. And um, what strikes me now reading this is that so much of what people are doing in philosophy of mind today is really dealing with the issues that were laid out by people like Huxley and dubois Raymond. Um, but if you read philosophy of mind textbooks, you always hear about Descartes and Leibniz, but you don't hear about um, these particular debates which occurred later on. on. Yeah, so it's, it's very embarrassing for English speakers like myself that um, amongst Anglophones, our language skills are so bad, so we need these um, translation headsets, but um, even though we're coming here to speak in Germany. So I will put some of the original German text on the slides for you. So anyway, it's not an entirely English presentation. <laughs> okay, um, so this is about the famous um, lecture, Über die Grenzen des Naturkennens. Is that, is that a good enough pronunciation? <laughs> okay. okay, very good. Okay, so um, the surveying of the limits of science was a popular activity in the last third of the 19th century. In Britain, Huxley and the people that he was arguing with um, in the church often debated this. Um, also, James Clark Maxwell, who himself had done research on color, he was an evangelical Christian, so he was very much a believer in the possibility of theistic science, and he um, was you know, arguing with people like Huxley over the role of theistic explanation <coughs> and the limits of um, natural scientific understanding. So there's an interesting book on this topic um, by Stanley. It's called um, Huxley's Church and Maxwell's Demon. So if you're interested in this topic, I recommend that. Anyway. Um, but one of the um, most famous interventions here is um, Emile dubois Raymond's public lecture of 1872 <clears throat> on the limits of our knowledge of nature. And... Um, so the final word of this lecture is his ignorabimus, we shall not know. And this is now quite a standard phrase. It um, even has its own Wikipedia page, this one word. So <coughs> that's good. Um, so the thing that we will never know or understand is the relationship between mind and body. So how the buzz of electrical activity in our brains gives rise to emotions, sensations, and all of our conscious experience. Um, so he writes, astronomical knowledge of the brain, the highest grade of knowledge we can expect ever to have, discloses to us nothing but matter in motion, 
but we cannot by means of any imaginable movement of material particles bridge over the chasm between the conscious and the unconscious. So this is a really nice expression of what philosophers of mind today call the explanatory gap. Um, and this is this gap between natural sciences and the understanding of mental experiences. <clears throat> So why does he think consciousness is so utterly inexplicable? To answer this question, we must examine his own notions of scientific explanation. As with Huxley, the ideas of reductionism and mechanism are predominant, and he gives them the particular um, embodiment with this um, Laplacian demon. So Laplace's demon is a superhuman intelligence who knows all the positions of the atoms that make up the universe. Um, he has complete knowledge of the laws of nature that govern the interaction of atoms, and whose mind has the computational power to calculate how the configurations of all these atoms will evolve to predict the state of the world at any point in the future. And this Laplacian demon can also rewind the calculations to work out every event that happened in the past. <clears throat> so the Laplacian demon is the embodiment of the ambitions of reductionistic and mechanistic science because to say that the future of the whole world can be predicted by such calculations is to say that everything that is to happen occurs because of the smallest constitutions of matter so that's the reductionist idea everything just boils down to the very tiniest components and the mechanistic idea that everything happens because of the clockwork-like interactions between these tiny parts. <coughs> so on this conception of science, the limits of what a near-divine Laplacian mind may know are the boundaries of all possible future science. So no matter how advanced science becomes, how completely sophisticated in a way that de bois Raymond could never imagine, he says that this Laplace's demon sets the limits of science. If this demon could not understand consciousness, then science will never understand consciousness. So, thus, Dubois Raymond describes how the explanation of how subjective experience arises in the brain is excluded from the comprehension of the Laplacian mind. So, I'll, I'll read the English. You can tell me if it's a good translation. So, what conceivable connection subsists between <coughs> definite movements of definite atoms in my brain on the one hand, and on the other hand such, for me, primordial, indefinable, undeniable facts as these? I feel pain or pleasure, I experience a sweet taste, or smell a rose, or hear an organ, or see something red. So I highlight the red just to show that the problem of color is linked to all of these problems of consciousness. And he says, it's absolutely and forever inconceivable that a number of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen atoms should not be indifferent as to their own position and motion, past, present, or future. So in other words, if we just think about the constituents of the universe in terms of atoms, an individual atom doesn't care about it, anything that happens to it. It's just a lump of material. So how come when we put all of these atoms together, they have a point of view, they have feelings, they care about what happens, just as you care about what happens in your own life. This is really, really surprising from this reductionist point of view. Um, now, remember that for Locke, he had the same, he noted that, that there was this dissimilarity between the external causes and our experience of color. So not just that, um, so he thought that there might be just one particular texture of matter which could be um, perceived as green, but he said, well, I can't explain why it will look green to you. Um, but he said, God's wisdom has made it so. So he just appealed to God's wisdom, even though it, for, for him it was inconceivable that certain arrangements of matter would look to us in particular ways. Um, but Someone like Dubois Raymond is a naturalistic science, so it's part of his philosophy of science that God is excluded from explanations of um, in science. So you can't appeal to the divine order. 
So you just have this inexplicable fact. <coughs> um, so also what makes this problem particularly acute um, in this context is that through the work of Helmholtz and others on trichromacy, on the variation of color vision, colors came to be seen more as subjective than objective phenomena. Um, so before we could think of colors as um, a question of physics, so what arrangements of matter is the fundamental nature of green. And then people realized that actually the way, the way that we perceive color is very much to do with our individual psychology. And so the explanation has to come from the sciences of the brain. Um, and so there's this problem of how subjective sensations arise inexplicably from the matter of the brain. And neurophysiology just gives us no clue as to how that happens. So the philosophical problem of color has now been sewn up with the problem of the relationship between mind and brain. And they're both in this explanatory gap. <clears throat> so ignorabilis wasn't the last word on this subject. So many people were shocked that Emile dubois Raymond had stood up and said that science had had any limits. Um, so it was in this context of, um, you know, radical, new science, mechanistic science, confronting um, the established church and like who would you know, have the final say about um, the nature of the universe. And so it was seen as reactionary for someone like Dubois Raymond to say that science um, could be restricted in the questions that it could answer. So lots of people um, argued against him and this controversy is known as the ignorabimus trite and people see it as one of the defining intellectual controversies of its time. It was also talked about in the 20th century, so Carnap refers to it, Rudolf Carnap, Ludwig Wittgenstein refer to this controversy. Um, so it surprises me, and I just keep reiterating this point, that people just don't talk about it much um, in philosophy of mind, or you know, people like Thomas Nagel or Joseph Levine, who introduce this term of the explanatory gap, they don't actually talk about this text um, and this context of neurophysiology. So anyway, <clears throat> I will conclude. So I have a few minutes left. So in my, in my book, um, if you haven't read it, I'll just quote a line from the start of chapter two. So in my book, I wrote that colors were not a problem before Galileo. Um, today I've argued that colors were not a problem before Helmholtz, Huxley, Huxley and dubois Raymond. Or more accurately, I could say colors were more of a problem after dubois Raymond. For I should also point out that my alternative narrative is not strictly inconsistent with the more familiar one that places the action in the 17th century. Colors were also more of a problem after Galileo, Descartes, Newton. Because each of these thinkers made statements which can lead one to question any naive beliefs about the place of color in nature. And if we wished, we could trace this line of thought even further back to the atomists of the ancient world. So there's also um, this quotation uh, from Democritus, um, which seems to deny the reality of color, sweetness, um, all of these secondary qualities. And this quotation often comes up when philosophers today are writing about color, which is interesting that they see that there's this whole line that goes back to the ancient world. Um, so what argument is there for restricting ourselves to this close range historical view of the era just before our own? One reason is that in the concluding decades of the 19th century, there was a newfound emphasis on th synthesizing the advances of the sciences. Um, so work across zoology, geology, physics, chemistry, and physiology, people were trying to build this all into a coherent naturalistic worldview. And I think the um, importance of biology, so evolutionary theory is really significant to this kind of synthetic pro project of the time. And it's when the ambitions of an all-pervading world picture come to the front of people's mind that worries arise over what this new vision of the world leaves out. dubois Raymond starts his lecture on the limits of science with the image of science as a military victor 
in the fashion of Alexander the Great. <clears throat> so he writes, just as a world conqueror of ancient times, as he halts for a day in the midst of his victorious career, might long to see the boundaries of the vast territories he has subjugated more clearly defined, so that here he may levy tribute of some nation hitherto exempt, or that there he may discern some natural barrier that cannot be overcome by his horsemen, and which constitutes the true limit of his power, in like manner, it will not be out of place if natural science, the world conqueror of our times, resting as on a festive occasion from her labour, should strive to define the true boundaries of her immense domain. So, on this vision, subjective experiences, such as the simple pleasures of seeing and scenting a bunch of violets, are the refugees displaced with the all-conquering advance of modern science. Thank you. Thank you, Marita, for a fascinating talk and also for keeping it relatively concise, mm -hmm. leaving us quite a bit of time for discussion. Mm -hmm. Questions? Hi, thank you. Very mm -hmm. nice talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, so I'll start a, a link uh, just before your talk. I was mm -hmm. talking to someone about the way we contrast things and how we, mm -hmm. uh, we can contrast reality and illusion mm -hmm. rather than reality and construction. Mm -hmm. which are two quite different things, but often have conflated. Right. So another way of doing it is objective and subjective. Right. <coughs> so uh, subjectivity if is not a problem mm -hmm. if you're a 17th century natural philosopher mm -hmm. who believes in the soul. Mm -hmm. But it can be a problem if you're a late 19th century scientist right. who's trying to make claims that are compatible with evolutionary theory. Right. And of course, Spencer is pre-publication right. of origins, mm -hmm. but he's, he knows about evolution right. uh, theory. Yeah. So I'm thinking, what about the psychological scientists who are less concerned about evolutionary theory? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of others, like Carpenter and Alexander Bain, mm -hmm. obviously later James mm -hmm. in a sense, right. who wanted to hang on to mm -hmm. notions of free will right. and, and s elements of dualism. Yeah. How did they talk about colour? Does that, does that fit into your story? Yeah, so um, that's a good idea of things to look at. So actually, um, the next thing I was going to look at uh, was um, how James picks up on and responds to people like Huxley and, and Spencer, because um, this very um, closed notion of consciousness is just this epiphenomenal stuff that natural sciences can't explain, this very narrow view of consciousness. You see in James wri James's writing, he doesn't accept that straightforwardly. Um, he uses consciousness in a more expansive sense that can't just be, he's, he's very much against this atomistic idea that you know consciousness is just made up of these bits and pieces and actually it's much more tied together with this famous stream of consciousness idea where it all flows together. So I want, yeah, I do wonder if that notion of consciousness that he's retaining and developing is part of his whole um, rejection of that very tight naturalism. Um, how it fits in with um, Bain and Carpenter, I would have to, you know, look look at them in that context. I haven't, I haven't, yeah, found out what they said about colour specifically. But yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you for your talk. Okay. Uh, just a brief question born out of complete ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, how do these 19th century guys refer, if at all, to the 17th century? Mm -hmm. Do they call them as witnesses, or do they, uh, how do yeah. they deal with it? Yeah, so, so uh, one thing I find very interesting, the, the Huxley um, paper on uh, um, conscious autonomy, he's very, um, <coughs> self-consciously referring back to uh, the 17th century. So he begins talking about uh, Descartes and saying that what we're doing in physiology now is just the culmination of the idea that René Descartes had back in the 17th century. Um, and he also talks about Hartley's discovery of um, uh, how the blood flows. And so this idea that modern science um, was born all of a sudden in the 17th century was being, 
propagated by people two centuries later. And I think it's to do with, you know, Huxley was very much about the institutionalization of science, um, giving science this new status that it didn't have before. It certainly didn't have um, the characteristics of, you know, research institutions and funding that we associate with it today. It certainly didn't have that back in the 17th century. So this idea that there was this sudden like genius idea that came up and changed the world. Um, that seems like a historical fiction which most historians of science have projected back onto the 17th century and that was beginning already with Huxley. Um, um, I mean, one, one thing that other people have noticed in that animal autonom automata paper is that he doesn't mention uh, Lemaitre who wrote in the 18th century about um, the man being this self-winding machine. So very much the same idea that Huxley is talking about doesn't get mentioned um, in that paper, though um, it is talked about elsewhere. But there's certainly a tendency to highlight the 17th century. Thanks for your talk, and as we are in uh, Germany and dealing with the color theory, Goethe is around. Mm -hmm. uh, so the interesting thing is that Goethe came across the, the problem of color blindness. Mm -hmm. And so he and Schiller went out to find somebody being color blind, mm -hmm. and they found a person that couldn't see blue. Mm -hmm. And they asked their friend Angelika Kaufmann to paint a landscape without blue, mm -hmm. and she did. And uh, this image was printed okay. in, in the uh, editions mm -hmm. of Goethe mm -hmm. Color 3, and that was possible only because lithography had been invented okay. meanwhile, so you could have scientific illustrations right. showing color, mm -hmm. which you hadn't before in this uh, 17th mm -hmm. century, for instance, you have all these black and mm -hmm. white copper prints, right. shown for instance in Camera Obscura, mm -hmm. uh, although everybody knew that inside of a Camera Obscura you have a a colorful image of the outside mm -hmm. world, a moving colorful mm -hmm. image. Nevertheless, it sho was shown in right. black and white all mm -hmm. the time. So color comes into um, scientific illustrations mm -hmm. in the 19th century only. Mm -hmm. And I think there, there is somehow interesting interplay of mm -hmm. these yeah. illustrations. In yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, that, that certainly makes sense that the new, yeah, new ways of thinking about color scientifically would be um, reinforced and shaped by, you know, the means that people had to communicate, you know, through publication, what they were, how they were thinking about these phenomena. Yeah. Yes. Um, just a little remark. Um, you. Um, there were two sentences about echolocation, mm -hmm. and you said that um, mm -hmm. it is not uh, belonging to the mm -hmm. uh, curriculum of uh, human senses. Right. Now, I think it's evident that blind mm -hmm. people use that sense. Yeah. And, um, well, do you s see a chance that the uh, five or six sense schema that exists in Occidental uh, philosophy mm -hmm can be innovated to a seventh or eighth? Yeah, seventh? I, yeah, I mean, yeah, so I, I spoke too hastily when I mentioned that example. So Thomas Nagel, um, it's a paper from back in the 70s. He, he just states as a fact that humans lack this modality. And then um, certainly it's been talked about much more since then that um, everyone can, to some extent, get the sense of the space around them from how sounds are reflected from walls. And um, I, so I, when I read about this a few years ago, they, um, I tried to get a sense of whether I had any like specific sensations associated with using sound to um, feel boundaries. And I, I couldn't like feel anything specifically. And maybe if I practiced more, I could do, but um, it's, I mean, I think one of the things about thinking of the senses as only five is then it, it's a very small number and then you think, well, for each of those modalities, 
there's probably only a small number of sensations that we could associate with them. And so you think that everything that we um, experience as conscious qualia, maybe there's just like a hundred different sensations, a hundred different qualia, and maybe we could work out how the brain generates those hundred and, and you know, we'd have all of the neural correlates of consciousness. But actually, um, when you expand the number of sensors to include the different ways that we use different modalities, so how we use sound um, to get the sense of space like in echolocation, then everything that we are trying to explain in terms of qualia becomes much more complicated as well. So I think it's right to like, extend those boundaries outwards to different modalities because I think like there's no right or wrong answer to how many modalities there are. If you define them more in terms of the different ways that we can use them, it does extend outwards. And also if we talk about action, as Wolf Wolfgang was talking about before, then that also means that we think about these modalities quite differently and we can number them quite differently. So. Um, we have time for perhaps two more questions. As we have spare time, I, I mm. wanted to comment on that because that's kind of an experimental approach. I mean, people mm. start to follow, like Kevin O'Regan and other people, mm -hmm. to to do use and to induce new senses in right. a sense, like a sense of like a vibrating bell that tells right. you where north is and stuff like yeah. that, and see whether these experimentally induced senses develop a kind of qualia mm -hmm. type of experience. Because that's in a sense easier experimentally because you 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 don't build on top of a sense that already mm -hmm. exists but you try to create a new mm -hmm. sense that doesn't exist in humans and i think that's a very exciting experimental approach mm -hmm. because then you you exen essentially know that everyone is stimulated the same way and mm -hmm. you have experimental controls mm -hmm. i think that's a mm -hmm. very interesting approach mm -hmm. to to that but that was just a comment to the mm -hmm. sixth seventh and so yeah. on sense yeah um i mean when when they're using um these kinds of experiments. So they're, they're using touch um, reception to begin with, but then you're getting information about the world which is quite different from you normally would from touch. So yeah, it's a very interesting question, like how you actually experience that subjectively. I don't know. It's something I would like to try. <laughs> If there are no more questions, then let us thank Margrethe Schilbuta again for her talk. Thank you. Thank you.